All right. Hopefully we've all taken a break. Maybe it was a few days break. For me, it was about 15 minutes. Let this thing, let my earbuds recharge. Got a glass of water. And now we got to finish. We got two more derivations to do. I promise they're only one page long. They aren't too bad in total, only one side. And we have one example to go through and we want to demonstrate a few things on the computer. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is a very simple attempt at a regression. Now, you can do the full Bayesian stuff where we do all the distributions of the slope and the intercept and also the standard deviation. There's three parameters here. But for the sake of brevity and also to make a point, I'm not going to actually do that. All right. And, and instead, we're going to keep it simple. All right. So this is like Fisher Price, my first regression. All right. So what we say, first of all, the data is going to be distributed normally about some uh, mean and have a standard deviation. And you hear us say mu i because while well, before we assumed all the Chapman students were just had heights distributed around their mean, here each data point is not distributed around the same mean, it's distributed about the line. And so each one has a different point where we expect it to be centered around. And that mu i is going to be equal to a uh, just some alpha plus beta xi, right? So in other words, I could have written this as yi is normally distributed around alpha plus beta xi comma sigma squared, right? That's the alternative way I could write this. But this, this lets it split it up. And sometimes when you're writing these equations out, these things can get pretty complicated. So it's nice to have it on a separate line. Because we're Bayesians, in theory, we would also want to have a distribution for a prior distribution on our alphas, our betas, and also our sigma. So if we're actually doing the full Bayesian inference, we would have to have all these distributions, right? This is our prior for alpha, beta, sigma, which are our three parameters. And then this right here defines the likelihood right here for our data. Don't worry, in this case, I'm gonna actually just want, make all this one and ignore it all. Furthermore, I'm also going to even assume that we know the sigma is a constant. So we're not even going to have that as a parameter. So I'm going to make our lives so much easier because of that. And then I'm still not even going to evaluate the whole thing, as we'll see. So without further ado, let's get started. Once again, luckily with all this Bayesian stuff, it's always just the same darn equation every time. Probability of our alpha and our beta, our slope and intercept, conditional on our data, right? Conditional on all of our y's and x's, right? Or our x, y pairs, right? That's gotta be proportional to the probability of the y's given our alphas and betas and x's, which are, the x's are all just kind of, they're fixed there, right? times the probability of our alpha and our beta prior there. Um, okay, we can technically just leave off the x's. Doesn't even matter. That's kind of a formality. We can live without them. You understand the idea. Probability of the data given everything. So once again, this is going to be normally distributed and they're all independent of one another, conditional on their x's and the alpha and the beta. So this thing, we're going to get the same type of thing as before, where we have the product from i equals 1 to n of 1 over sigma root 2 pi e to the minus 1 over 2 sigma squared. Uh, which was going to assume sigma is just a constant that we know here, just to keep our lives easy. Uh, and then here we have y minus, I'm sorry, not y. Uh, yeah, yi minus alpha plus beta xi squared, right? Because here we expect that we have the line, right, alpha plus beta x. 
And then at some certain xi, we expect it to be right here, alpha plus beta xi. But in reality, it's right here, y. And we expected the data to be normally distributed about that point on the line. And so therefore, it's going to be the yi and where we actually expected it to be, right? And then we have to square that and give us all a normal distribution. And that's the likelihood of seeing each one of the data points is just the product of all of them because they're independent. All right, so this is the exact same thing that we started with last time. We also still have this prior. So we're going to write down the assumptions here that are the important assumptions. Actually, the sigma one, although know, I'm doing that to make our lives easier, we don't have to assume it at all. We'll get the same results. We just also will have a distribution for sigma. All right. Um, so anyway, so we're doing this. And uh, first assumption, first assumption, assumptions right here. One, uh, we have that uh, P of A comma B, our prior, is just proportional to one. So therefore, it just disappears. Right. This is a big simplifying assumption. I'll come back and actually loosen this one, weaken it, and get, I'm going to show you how it would actually affect things. All right. Uh, thanks to this thing, we can also get rid of this. And now the product of the exponential will just equal to the sum. So this thing is e to the minus 1 over 2 sigma squared sum of yi, you know, i equals 1 to n y minus alpha plus beta xi squared, All right? One thing that's useful to do here is instead of constantly writing alpha plus beta xi, we can just say yi hat, which is our predicted y, is just equal to alpha plus beta xi. That's just a nice little simplifying thing to make it look a little bit nicer. So if we do that and shorten it, yi squared, and that makes it clear that it's like, okay, how far off was the data from what we predicted it should be? Simple. All right. So now, you know, this still gives us our whole distribution. Uh, but let's do something a little bit easier. Because sometimes, well, you know, we're going to get this nice little joint distribution with alpha and beta. Which, by the way, this one is always looks kind of interesting. They tend to be negatively correlated. Not going to get into why, but that's what tends to happen with them. Um, but instead of actually trying to solve, you know, write out this joint distribution and everything, all we're going to do is we're going to get a nice little point estimate. We're going to pick one point that's relevant. Now we could pick the mean or the median for each, but what we're going to do is pick the maximum of this distribution. Take the maximum. All right, and the reason why is computationally easy. All right, that's one. Of the, that's pretty much the main reason why in this case. Now, I want to say that as a Bayesian, I like never actually do this. I'm only doing this as kind of a toy example to show you what kind of what you end up with when you do this. All right. So if we're only interested rather than in the whole distribution, our best estimate to them is going to be the maximum of this of the posterior. So now what we're going to do is say, OK, alpha hat, beta hat, right, which is our best estimate to alpha and beta, given our data, is going to be equal to, is going to be equal to the arg max over alpha and beta. So which alpha and beta give the maximum of what's inside of this e to the minus one over two sigma squared sum of i equals one to n y i minus y uh, hat i squared right simple we just got to find which alpha and beta maximizes this where keep in mind this right here is where the alpha and beta are right it's alpha plus beta xi don't forget that so if we're going to maximize this function, um, as you know, right, like suppose we said, okay, we want to maximize this function, right? Let's say that this is f of x, and we want to find which point maximizes it. 
if we take f of x minus 5, so that would shift everything down by 5, which I know I didn't do that great of a job of actually drawing there, but whatever, the maximum is still at the same point, right? Any monotonic transformation is what it's called to preserve the location of the maximum. And it turns out that if you take the log of a function, it preserves where the maximum is. You can check it out, you can try it out, it works, all right? So because of that, we can actually take the log of what's inside and still get the same answer. This is gonna be the arg max of alpha plus beta. In case you don't know, max is what the maximum value is. Arg max is which arguments alpha, beta give you the max, correspond to the max. So now we can take the log, you get minus one over two sigma squared, sum i equals one to n of yi minus y hat, yi hat squared. And once again, just like if we had had this guy and we multiplied it all by two, right? You just scaled everything by two, you would still get the same maximum argument. So right here, this little scalar out here doesn't affect the answer. We can get rid of that. And we end up with this, the arg max of the negative. And now what's this? This is like the square, this is the error, how far off we were. So it's the negative of the sum of squares of the errors that we're trying to maximize. That's awfully close to what we are typically used to hearing when doing regression. So you gotta remember here, if we wanna pull out the negative, right? If we have a function right here that we were trying to take the maximum of, and instead we wanna take the, if we had the negative of it, then we get the same spot, but instead of taking the maximum, we're taking the minimum. So if we wanna get rid of this negative, we can flip everything around, but we have to switch from a maximum to a minimum, and there it is. So this is equal to the arg min of alpha and beta of the sum from i equals one to n of yi minus y hat i squared. And so what's this saying? That for the posterior, if we just take the, we find the spot with the maximum, the alpha and beta that give us the maximum, uh, is just the least squares. We're trying to minimize the squared errors, right? That's least squares. And you notice right here, what's interesting is that in this derivation of it, you can get it other ways. The, the fact that it's the squared errors comes from the fact that it's e to the minus uh, y minus y hat squared. The squared in the, uh, in the uh, normal distribution actually comes all the way down to give us the least squares here, which is pretty neat. All right, that's one derivation of least squares, and I think it's a pretty cool one. Now, I should make a little point here about this, which is that this technique right here is called maximum likelihood. All right, sorry, so right here, I should also note here, uh, point maximum, point x estimate. In general, this is called the maximum likelihood. Likelihood estimator. All right, and the reason why is because if you remember, our posterior for our given the data, right? Remember our general formula here is equal to P of the data given the parameters times probability, the prior divided by probability of data. This is the general formula we've been using. If you remember this right here, this first term was the, uh, is the likelihood, right? In general, what happens is that if you were to take, uh, uh, because we set this to one, pretty much this went away. And so when we were taking the maximum of this thing, we were actually just taking the maximum of just the likelihood part of this equation. And that's why it's the maximum likelihood estimate. And this is, and the maximum likelihood is something that is actually like the go-to statistical technique for both, uh, for mainly, I mean, for frequentists, it's 
very, very common to do the maximum likelihood. Technically, it's not actually part of uh, frequentism, but uh, but Fisher was in favor of it. He he really liked the maximum likelihood estimator, and it has nice properties. You can show that asymptotically it approaches the true value. It's a it's a it's a good estimator and everything. So it's very um very popular among Bayesians. Uh, frequently, first of all, rather than doing the maximum likelihood, we actually take the full distribution and analyze the full distribution. But um, but also, if we were to do the maximum, rather than taking the maximum of the likelihood, we would maximize the entire equation here. We wouldn't just have some post uh, the prior of one. So what we call that is we would maximize this whole entire function, and this is called maximum a posteriori because it's the maximum of the posterior and so it's m a p maximum a posteriori while this one is maximum likelihood estimate mle so you'll frequently frequently see mle in pretty much any sort of statistics you see and you see right here in the case of uh, a regression here the mle gives you the least squares so it frequently gives kind of things you're used to. The max, the map, the maximum a posteriori, you'll sometimes actually see it with likelihood, but they give it a different name. People, in, only the Bayesians really call it map and refer to maximum a posteriori. And it's not even that common. Usually you do the full treatment, the full, the full Bayesian treatment, which we'll talk about in, uh, when we do derivation four, where to do it, since this math is so hard to deal with, like we're doing with all the integrals in number two, we are doing everything computationally. And there's a trick to doing it via Monte Carlo sampling, which we'll be talking about in just a minute. But the point is we have the, the, math, the maximum all posteriori, we have a prior in there. I wanna quickly show you what happens if we include a prior, just really easy prior here. So a very common little prior is to say that our, Beta and our alpha are normally distributed about zero. So this is called a weak regularizing prior with some with some defined sigma. All right. Uh, so what it will do, because this is a normal distribution, and maybe our data is pointing to the to them being over here, it's going to be like that number one Kalman filter where it's going to bring in any estimates of the beta towards zero. It'll actually bias them towards zero, depending upon how strong of the precision each one is. So you oftentimes use something that doesn't have a huge precision on here, but it'll weakly pull it in, just like some weak data that pulls it in towards zero. And it turns out that when you do that, you actually get better estimates. And so this is actually this technique's actually become really popular among uh, in data mining and data science and machine learning folks. Uh, it's called regularization, and it's really popular because you actually get better estimates than the maximum likelihood estimator, even though the at maximum likelihood estimator is the best uh, linear unbiased estimator, blue is the best unbiased one. This one actually biases the results towards zero because you know you can see, right? You If you put a prior that says, okay, our beta should be centered on zero, it's gonna pull in all the estimates towards zero. So it actually always underestimates the slope and the intercept, but it actually leads to better results usually. I'm not going to get into the details on why. But how do we do this? Well, what you do is uh, you have the same thing. All this is the same up to here. We're still doing the argmax, except instead of just crossing out this P, we have to add it in. Right? We have to add in this extra term, which will be our prior. And the prior here will be a, a times E to the minus one over two, I'll call this tau squared, where this this tau is the probability of a, a you know how wide our prior was on it, and then we have a uh, a a sorry not y there we have beta minus beta not uh, minus zero, all right squared. And so what's happening is that the further away beta is from zero, the less likely this data actually is, because remember, it's minus something squared, so it becomes less and less likely. And the same thing is for alpha, right? So we also have one for alpha. In general, people usually just kind of combine these together and say, okay, it's the sum over all of our parameters for i uh, equals one to two of, you know, I mean, well, 
we'll just say for theta in alpha and beta, right? And then it's the sum of the uh, theta squared, right? So you just kind of have this extra term in here, which says how likely is this uh, data for both the alpha and the beta, because they both have priors on them. All right, and so when we go down to here, this stays in here, right? This just adds on an extra negative term on this. So then we still have this extra negative here. And then finally down here, we're gonna have the argmin of this thing plus a, uh, this tau. Once again, it's still actually uh, in there. It's a little bit awkward. You know, we, we you can't quite get rid of this, uh, this uh, one over two sigma because now it's like doesn't multiply on both of them. So it kind of comes back in there. It doesn't matter too much. This is more about how precise your data is versus how precise your uh, your priors were, right? So this is doing the weighting between the two, just like how we had the precision on the other ones uh, when we were doing the Kalman filters. And then you have the sum of theta, uh, member of alpha comma beta, of theta squared. So what happens here, the, the details aren't that important. What matters is this, you still have all your least squares, but now you say plus this extra term where you know, you're trying to get the minimum, the alpha and beta that minimizes it. But while you can set it to minimize the least squares, unfortunately that alpha and beta you choose is getting penalized if it's far away from zero, right? The bigger the value of alpha and beta, the bigger this penalty becomes. And so what happens is that you have to bias your alpha and beta down a little bit to balance these out, where you lose a little bit of your accuracy as far as minimizing the error, but you get them close to zero, which is what your prior says. And so what this is typically called, so in, in Bayesian terms, this is just the maxima a posteriori, where we actually have a prior here. But in, in a lot of frequentists and data mining and stuff, they call this a penalized likelihood. All right, penalized likelihood. And the reason why, because you think about it, here's your likelihood, and now you've added some extra penalty term to it. And so you're frequently, when you're studying, whenever you're reading papers and stuff, they talk about doing a maximum likelihood estimate, or they'll talk about a penalized likelihood. And really what you can think of it from a Bayesian terms, a penalized likelihood is pretty much always corresponds having some prior on the values on the parameters and so that's resulting in a in a penalty all right and it turns out these are really good these are really really helpful and they become like i said very popular and so if you're interested you can read up on like ridge regression from lasso regressions which are very popular and i mean they're just used ubiquitously in, in machine learning and all they are ultimately is a linear regression but with some prior on the uh on the estimates that pull them towards zero so anyway that's kind of a little aside about maximum likelihood estimators and and penalized likelihoods all right so that's why i want to do that derivation because as we go on uh we're eventually in the next few weeks we're going to be going over john rust's paper and in it he does a not a surprise he does a maximum likelihood estimator because all of them because they always do maximum likelihood estimators for anything anything complicated, eventually you're going to do the maximum likelihood estimator. And it's actually a real pain sometimes because you got to actually find the maximum of the function. And sometimes they're incredibly complicated and you have a hard time finding them. It's also not always actually that great of an estimate because of something that we saw, I believe we saw it in the previous uh, week's lecture where Sometimes I don't know if we actually went over it in this class. I don't know if we go over it in my other class, but um, you know, sometimes the posterior in extreme cases can actually look something like this, where it's like if we only flip tails, then it looked like the probability of heads was actually like the best guess to it. If we did a maximum likelihood, it would have been zero. And yet it doesn't really capture the heart of it, which is that you know our average guess is actually over here, our median is over here, but our maximum is all the way at zero. It's actually all the way on the border of what's allowable. 
And that's going to actually happen sometimes, which isn't very pleasant. Um, and so sometimes the maximum likelihood estimators, they actually have problems, A, solving it, and B, the interpretation isn't always clear because it just suddenly sets something to the most extreme value because it just so happens that the data is pushing up kind of close to that edge. And so uh, it can cause some problems in your interpretation of things. While with the uh, while with the Bayesian approach where you actually take the typical mean or the median and such, um, you get stuff that's actually more reasonable because this actually has to do with what you actually think the range is and a little bit more reasonable value, even though it's not the maximum. So anyway, you have that. Now, for the last thing we're going to talk about today, and, and trust me, this is the last one, so if you need to, you, know, you can take a little break for a minute or two. Um, this is what we're going to talk about is uh, how we actually deal in Bayesian, in the Bayesian world, how do we actually deal with these complicated models? Because like I said, you know, um, doing it analytically, you quickly see it starts getting really painful. And once you add hundreds of parameters, trying to do all those integrals just becomes impossible. Or when you start using non-trivial priors, they don't combine nicely, you can't integrate them at all, and you're out of luck. So what happens is uh, you might say, okay, well, we can do it like on the computer where we did that grid approximation, right? Hey, right, where we had the little points here, and then we evaluate it, we multiplied everything together, and we just plugged in the values and we get the and we get it, right? We get the posterior, and it looked really cool, right? And we got this nice little curve. We can do that, right? Not so nicely, because we use a thousand grid points there. Let's say it doesn't matter if we did a thousand or a hundred, it doesn't matter. If we had done it for the, uh, and, and I have the code somewhere, I'm not going to pull it up, uh, for that T distribution where we had two parameters, we couldn't just have a hundred points. We would instead have to do a grid of points, right? And how many points would we have if we wanted a hundred in each direction, right? Well, that's a hundred squared or in other words, 10 to the fourth, which is 10,000. If we did it for the le uh, least squares for the regression, that had three parameters. So suddenly it would have to be 100 cubed. And that's just for 100. If we want 1,000 cubed, suddenly we're already up to a billion points. We have to evaluate at a billion points just to do a simple regression. That'll take quite a while. Uh, then you make matters worse. What about the parameters where I was talking about where we have like 200 parameters? Right, this thing's growing really fast. Right, this will suddenly be tens uh, cubed if we want a thousand to the two hundred, which equals ten to the six hundred. And of course, you know that's just completely ridiculous. We can never actually do that large of a grid with that many dimensions. And so you have this curse of dimensionality problem. So we can't do it analytically. We can't do a nice little simple computational thing. So what we have to fall back on is instead doing a Monte Carlo sampling. So what we have is we're gonna have this posterior, right? Like with that egg shape with the T distribution. And instead of actually getting the full distribution and evaluating it, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sample from it. Right? And as long as we sample from it reasonably, as you learned in your last in last semester's class with Ryan, with Dr. French, uh, you can estimate stuff using the Monte Carlo samples, right? And it'll approach the, the true value as long as you get a good sampling. So the trick is going to have to be that we have to be able to sample from any arbitrary n-dimensional distribution. And it turns out this is incredibly non-trivial. And in fact, it was a fairly unsolved problem for quite a while. It wasn't until the 1950s that they really started to get even an idea of how to do it and the computational power to do it. And then there were several years of advancements that didn't really take off until probably around the 80s or 90s. And then even then, uh, the method which we're going to be talking about today, uh, it kind of, it, it has problems. You still have to be able to do, to do it well, you still need to be able to do some of the math and you have to have some nice mathematical features of your posterior. Um, but then about, oh, 10 years ago, within the last 10 years, there's been an even newer technique. And now that's kind of taken over as a standard and it lets you really sample from any distribution really nicely. Uh, pretty reliably. It can still be improved. It still isn't very easy to parallelize it. So, uh, it, so that's a little bit of an issue. 
but it's overall very good. And so we'll, so I just want to talk about those basic ones. I'm just going to go in details on one of them because the first technique that was developed back in the fifties, that was very popular in the eighties and nineties. And, you know, some people are even using it today, even though, you know, I mean, it has less use these days is called MCMC. And what does this stand for? It's Markov chain Monte Carlo. Yeah, we're back to Markov chains. Monte Carlo. And this lets you sample from an arbitrary distribution. Also, it has a very important additional uh, feature, which I forgot to include, which is that frequently when we have this posterior, we don't actually have the full posterior. This doesn't actually sum up to one usually. Usually what we have is given theta, uh, you know, theta given the data, all we have is something proportional to the value we actually want. And this will actually sample even if you only have something that's within a constant of proportionality. So even if this whole thing integrates up to say like 800 or whatever, it can still sample from it. That's a very important feature because still having to calculate anything, you know, if we want to calculate the normalization constant, we'd have to be able to integrate the whole thing. And the whole reason why we wanted to sample is because we can't do the darn integrals. So actually finding the summation even, just to get it normalized, is a real pain. So being able to sample reliably even from unnormalized distributions is also a very important feature. So without any further ado, let's talk about this Markov chain Monte Carlo. So first I'm gonna actually go through an example of it to show it working in a discrete case. And then I'm gonna prove it in the continuous case. And we haven't dealt with continuous Markov chains before. So the derivation will be pretty impressive. It'll be, it's only a few lines, but it'll kind of be like, oh, okay, I'll just accept it to work. All right. But we'll do it just for a fact. All right. So number four here is the reason why we're doing this is to do a continuous Markov chain. And in this case, what I mean by continuous is that rather than just having n states, it actually will have like an infinite number of states and it'll be like a function, which is pretty cool. All right. So in this specific Markov chain Monte Carlo, this is a set of approaches. This is like a whole uh, group of them. And we're going to talk about specifically the Metropolis algorithm. There's a really small addition to it. So you'll typically hear it as a Metropolis Hastings algorithm. It's just a very tiny addition. I'm not even gonna talk about it. Uh, it really is like, like two lines extra. And you're like, boom, okay, there it is. That was easy. Just like an extra, an extra little factor that you multiply in and then it's the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. We'll talk about the Metropolis algorithm. So suppose that we have you know, the story goes, this is a, a kind of a classic story here where you have five islands, all right? Three, four, and five. And the population on them, we don't have to, you know, it's proportional here, right? For every one person on this island, there's five people on this island. For every one, there's four on there. For every uh, two on here, there's three on here, et cetera, right? So there's, you can see, in total, let's just suppose this is the number of people, one, two, three, four, five, you know, there's 15 people in all, all right? And just as a hint here, these are going to be like our different uh, uh, possible theta values, and we want to be able to sample from them an equal number of times, all right? That's just, you know, but we'll carry on with the metaphor where you have islands, and what you have is a king who wants to visit the islands in proportion to how the population is. So for every one day he spends on here, he wants to spend five days on this island, right? Or in other words, of course, for every one of these we sample, we want five of these. So his advisor tells him that this is how they're gonna do it. He starts off in a, cer in a certain location, let's say he starts off at one, and every day he's gonna flip a coin. If it comes up heads, he's going to consider going clockwise right? If it's heads. If it's tails, he's going to consider moving to the island that's counterclockwise. All right. Now he doesn't guarantee he goes. He is going to consider going there to the new island. Now, what actually determines whether or not he goes? Well, 
let's look at say this uh, right here. Let's instead of starting at one, I'll do an example from two, just because it's actually relevant here because one happens to be the smallest value, and so it's not a very good example, right? So uh, I think I said heads there and tails here. So the rule goes like this: if the island he's considering to go to is a bigger island, he goes to it. Period. Right. So in this case, if he flips the coin, he's currently at island two. He flips the coin on the day for the day. And if it comes up tails, he considers going to three. And because that one has a, a larger population, he goes there. So he will move to three that day and he'll spend a day on three. If he flips heads, now he's looking at one. And one is, has a smaller population. So what he's going to do is that the probability that he goes is equal to the ratio of the two. So in this case, it's going to be one half because this has half the population of this one. Notice real fast, we don't need to know once again just we're doing the sampling. It's only about the ratio of the two. So if they're both, if we multiplied all the population by two, so this was two, four, six, eight, ten, it was just now become two over four, and it's still one half. The ratio stays the same, even if we multiply all these by some constant of proportionality. So what's nice about that is that uh, even if this is unnormalized, this algorithm stays the same. So anyway, so we have this method, and I'm going to claim to you that just like uh, what happens with the um, like with the rain and sun, you know, the rainy and sunny Markov chain that we did, where you maybe start off sunny and you run through this algorithm a bunch, eventually, in the long run, you'll find yourself spending one fifteenth of the time here, two fifteenths here, three fifteenths here four fifteenths of the days here and five fifteenths of the days there, which is exactly the portion that we want. This algorithm will work. All right, and now let's just quickly show it by quickly drawing up the Markov chain. So here's today, here's tomorrow. And yes, I learned how to spell tomorrow. It's with two R's. As soon as I got to my computer, and I tried typing it. I was like, ah, there's two R's of course and one M. Now it looks perfect. The problem was that I first tried it with two M's and it didn't look right. I did it with one R and one M and it didn't look right. And so I just knew it was wrong. I just, on the fly lecture and I couldn't see. So anyway, so we have island one, two, three, four, and five. One, two, three, four, and five. So first of all, if we're at island one, what are the odds that we, oh, and I didn't mention this, right? We consider going to one, and we go there with probability one half. What happens if we choose not to? What if uh, by one half we don't? We stay put. We stay at the same island. So first things first. If we're at island one, what are the odds that we go to three or four? Zero, right? Because we never are going all the way across, right? All we're doing is looking to go either counterclockwise or clockwise. Now, if we come up with a tails, which comes up half the time. What's the probability that we go there? Well, because two is bigger than one, we go there 100% of the time that we flip the tails. Similarly, if we flip heads, we are considering going to five, and since that has a higher population, we guarantee to go there too. So we have a 50% ch chance of going to two, we have a 50% chance of going to five, and do we ever stay at one? No, we don't. All right. Now, for two, the odds of going to five or four are, all, are zero. If we flip tails, we consider going to three, and because that one has a larger population, we always go there. So half the time we're going to be going there. Here we're going from two to one, though, when we flip that one, which is half the time we flip it, we do that. And during that one half, there is only a 50% chance that we actually go, right? So it's one half times one half. The other half of the time, we're going to stay put. So it's one half times one half here, right? So therefore it's one fourth, one fourth, and one half. All right. Because you know, you can imagine we flip the coin, it comes up heads, and now it goes, oh, well, now it's a 50-50 chance to so flip another coin. If it comes up heads, it actually goes through with it, comes up tails, you stay put. How about for three? Well, there's a one half chance that you go to four, no chance of going to five or one. And then for the half of the time that you flip the heads, there is a two out of three chance that you go there. And there is a one out of three chance that you stay put. All right. And then for the four, there's a 50% chance we go on to five. 
there is a zero chance that you go to one or two. I know this looks a little bit messy, actually. Um, but, you know, just bear with me. Maybe we'll draw this thing, little grid lines for ourselves. All right. Fractions are never clean in a matrix, especially multiplication of fractions. And then our odds of going from four to three is going to be one half times three fourths, because that's the ratio of the population. So the other half, the so one fourth of the time of that half, we stay put. And then finally, for the five, going from five, we aren't going to go to two or three, that's zero. Half the time, we're going to be uh, considering going down to four. And in those cases, there's a four-fifth chance we go. And so therefore, there is a one out of five chances that we stay put. And then in the other half of the time, where we consider going down to one, we only will go with it one-fifth of the time because the population is much lower there. And so therefore, we have to add on one half times four fifths that we stay put. And so this thing right here ends up being one half, all right? All right, that's fine. Let's quickly simplify this. And then let's prove that the, that the uh, vector one, two, three, four, five is an eigenvector. That's what we're gonna prove that in the long run, the odds should be one fifteenth, two fifteenths, three fifteenths, four fifteenths, five fifteenths. All right, so let's do that. So this guy right here, let's just fill this out. Zero, one half, zero, zero, one half, one fourth, one fourth, one half, zero, 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 one sixth. Um, what did I write here? What is this? Uh, two thirds, I see. Okay. Uh, that's going to be two sixths. Uh, one half, zero, 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 uh, three eighths, one eighth, one half, and then one tenth, zero, zero, uh, four tenths, and one half, right? That looks a little bit cleaner. Let's just make sure this sums up to one, sums up to one. Sums up to one, sums up to one, sums up to one. So that looks good. All right, now, if supposedly we claim that, you know, that an eigenvector is supposed to be one fifteenth, two fifteenths, three fifteenths, four fifteenths, five fifteenths. That's what we claim. But given the fact that that's supposed to be an eigenvector, anything along that direction is going to be an eigenvector. So for the sake of brevity here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And as long as the eigenvector uh, is that, as long as that's in the same direction, it should work. And the eigenvalue, it better be 1. Now, because I've already gone up to this edge of this board, I'm going to have to actually say what the multiplication is on this side. Let's see here. 1 times 0. 2 times 1 fourth is 1 half plus zero, plus zero, plus five tenths, which is one half. So that means one half plus one half, we get one. A half plus a half is one plus a half. Uh, I've made a terrible error here. Um, let me see here. We're in trouble here because this is three halves. I've already messed things up. How can that be? Uh, that is very unfortunate. Let me see this here for one second. Oh, uh, I'm a fool. That's fine. Two times one half. This is a two now, not a one. I was doing one again. So two times that is one plus one half plus, uh, I'm sorry, wait up. One half plus one half plus one half. Oh, it really is one half, huh? I'm not, a, I'm not stupid. I'm just wrong. All right, give me one second here. Have I messed something up? I probably must have. But, um, doesn't look wrong to me. Would 1 of 15th have worked any better? 1 half of 1 15th? 1 half of 1 15th? 
Hmm. Let me see here. Just let me look at this for one moment here because it could be, no, if it's the eigenvector, it should be fine. Let me look at the last one right here. This is supposed to be one half plus zero plus zero plus two plus five halves. So that's two and a half, three, five. So that looks fine. Maybe I'll, I'll go backwards here and see which ones are wrong and I'll figure out where I must have made my mistake. Because I must have made a mistake somewhere, either in my math just the last second here or something. So let's see here. For this one, it's zero, zero, three halves plus one half is two plus 20 tenths, which is two. So that gives us four. That looks good. I'm guessing that the three must be wrong then. So we get zero, one, two, plus 12 eighths. Yeah, that looks wrong. So I must have made the mistake right here. Um, yeah, I made the mistake right here. This is supposed to be a two and a one. Right, I think I had that at one point. I must have just written it wrong. Because going down from three to two should be two-thirds chance. And then uh, half the time you do that. So it's two-thirds. I think I must have mixed up the one-third and the two-third there. You probably already caught it because you were following along. You're going, ah, oh, geez, that guy's doing the wrong math. And it took me a while, but I finally found the mistake. So let's try this again now. So it's one-half plus one-half is one. Three times two-six is two. And, you know, so that, that's one right there, and then one half plus one half, that gives us two, that's good. And then finally, the three right here, let's take care of that one. Zero, one, one and a half, plus another one and a half is three. So there we go. We've proven that this really is an eigenvector. That in the direction of the amount that we want to be sampling from it, it's actually true. So what happens now, and if you think about this, this is kind of like with the Monopoly board. Where if you remember the Monopoly board, when we did it, you know, there's some probability of being on different squares, and then it drops down to zero for jail, and then it kind of like popped up a little bit, and then uh, then it uh, popped up again for, uh, oh, no, no, sorry. This was jail, so I think it popped up for jail, and then it popped down for go to jail, because you immediately uh, teleported away, and then you saw that it was a little bit lower in the greens, and then it went back, right? So this was the long run average of being on any one of the squares, right? And so if you said, okay, right now you're, you're at this percentage of being, chance of being in you know, any one of the squares, the next period, you'd have the same value. This was the stationary. This is the eigenvector. But also what it meant was that if we actually started on go and we actually rolled the die and did the Monte Carlo sample where we actually moved around the board, and we did it for millions and millions of times. And then we averaged it out, we would get the same value. And so what's cool about this is that it shows that if we actually start off here and we're doing the simulations by actually flipping the coin and moving around, you do it long enough and you then you take the average and it's gonna come out to be one fifth, two fifth, three fifth, four fifth, five fifths. Uh, one fifteenth, two fifteenths, you know what I mean, right? Where they're all in proportion to their uh, population. And so what's cool about this is that this shows that this method will actually sample from the distribution of work. Now, in general, the general formula for this uh, method, for the Metropolis algorithm, is what you tend to say is that rather than restricting yourself to being, um, to being like flipping a coin and whatnot and being discrete uh, values, we move it into the continuous space. And so what you tend to have is something called the jumping distribution from let's say A and B, A given B. And what this says is that you have some distribution which says, okay, you're gonna select it rather than flipping a coin going left or right. In the continuous space, what, somebody, what you typically tend to do is you do something like a normal distribution. So let's suppose that we're trying to sample from that egg shape of the T, what you tend to do with the Markov I and mean, with the uh, Mon Markov chain Monte Carlo or the Metropolis algorithm is you're at some point, right? We have to take this from discrete space into continuous, right? You're at some point here, and what you do 
is you draw from a normal distribution, typically normal, but it can be any distribution you want, really, as long as it's symmetric, which I'll get into later. You'll see in a moment why it has to be symmetric. Um, but you draw from a normal distribution centered on where you currently are. And so now your proposed space is, let's say, up here, right? That's your proposal. Do you want to go there? Well, it depends. In this case, it's a less, it has a lower overall likelihood. You can just evaluate the likelihood and you take the ratio, you find it's lower, so there's only some certain probability you move to it. Meanwhile, now let's say that you end up choosing to go to it, right? So now you're here, and now you draw from a normal distribution centered around here. And now it's down here, and since it has a higher likelihood, you definitely go there. And now if you do it a third time, and you get something further away, for example, you might say, nope, I'm going to reject that one and stay put here for a second turn. Right? So now you have two points in that. Now, what's interesting about this is that the points, when you look at it, they're heavily correlated. Right? Between one and the next, you're going to be just within whatever your jumping distribution typically gives you. Right? And it's only in the aggregate, once you do it thousands or hundreds of thousands of iterations, will you actually get a representative sample around the whole thing. And oftentimes what people will do is they'll do something called thinning because sometimes you might actually spend like 10 iterations in a row at the same point. So what thinning does is once you have all the points that you've run like for 100,000 simulations, you just take one out of every say 10 of them, right? You just skip 10, uh, you know, for every one you take, you skip the next nine. And this way it helps reduce the correlation. It's kind of like if you wanted to get samples of where you end up on the Monopoly board, you rather than doing it after every single roll where, okay, well, last roll I was in the blue, so now I'm still on that side of the board, most likely, you throw the dice many times, and then every, you say, 10 rolls, do you actually record where your location was. That way, it's less correlation between them. It ultimately doesn't matter as long as the aggregate is actually representative of the distribution. So real fast, Let's quickly look at it on the, uh, well, actually, before we look at it, I want to quickly do, uh, I have a, a little uh, demonstration on the computer, which I can show you of this working. And it's really cool, uh, this, this demonstration. But before we do that, let's do the last derivation. We have one last little proof to do. And what we want to do is that in the, um, in the event of this continuous case, can we prove that uh, it is actually the that the true distribution is the eigenvector, or in this case, you can call it like the stationary function. Because in this case now, rather than being a vector of just points, it's actually the entire function. And we have to show that it converges to that distribution. That's the stationary distribution. So to do that, let's suppose that, let me put this away. Get another color here. I think maybe this one's the better one. Yeah, this is a nice one. All right. So suppose that at time t minus 1, we actually did take a draw drawn from the true distribution that we want, right? So this is all of our parameters, right? Our set of parameters is some n-dimensional thing, right? And this is our posterior. So this is the n uh, different, you know, this n-dimensional param uh, parameter space here. We have all these parameters, and we have our data right there, right? So this is just the probability of our parameters given our data, right? And so we have this posterior, and suppose that we actually have it working where we where we successfully got some random value from it, all right? Now what we want to prove is that theta t, the next draw, will also be from it prove theta t also drawn from the posterior. Because what that shows is that if we can get to that point where we're actually at the, uh, at the eigenvector, when we apply the function again, when we apply this distribution again, we're still at the eigenvector. We aren't going away from it, right? The definition of the stationary thing is that that's what we converge to. And once we've converged to it, we should be staying put, right? So if we draw from it at t minus 1, we should draw from it again at t. That's what our goal is. 
So suppose we have two sets of parameters. We have theta A and theta B, all right? And for the sake of this argument, they're just two random points in the whole space of all the different possible parameter sets. We're going to assume that in this case, probability of A given the data, so for the posterior, this one is not as likely as parameter B, right? So you have these two different points in the distribution, you know, like this. And we're just going to arbitrarily label one theta A and the other one theta B. And the key assumption here is that theta B is more likely than theta A, right? And that's all that we're doing, right? We can pick any two points. They're just arbitrary points, okay? So here's the proof. It's only a few lines. I promise you it's just a couple lines, and it's just all about the explanation. But unfortunately, the explanation is a little bit difficult to grasp. But I think you'll get the gist of it. We just need to show that these two, uh, that the second draw will be from the same distribution. So the key is that we say, what's the probability that uh, theta A, let me just write this out real fast, just so that way I don't make any mistakes. So what's the probability that we draw uh, theta t minus one is equal to theta a, and that theta t is equal to theta b? That's what we want to get. Oops, I have conditional there, and I just mean joint. What's the probability that both of those happen? Right, well, luckily, we can do this. This is a Markov chain. So what this is, is just equal to the probability. So first of all, we know that theta t minus one, that last parameter draw, was just drawn from the true distribution, from the posterior. So the odds that we would have gotten theta a is just probability of theta a given y. Easy, right? That's true, right? It's just a draw from the posterior. Now, what are the odds that we end up at theta b? Well, first we have our jumping distribution. Which, by the way, the reason why it has a T here, I don't think I explained that, is because since every period you change where you're centered on, it, it has to be at, uh, at time T, what is the jumping distribution? So then for the jumping distribution, what's the probability that we will have gotten get theta B given that we're currently at theta A? Right? And then, so this is just like, you know, in the... Uh, for the uh, for that uh, island thing, right? This is the what are the odds that I actually uh, flip a heads, which tells me that I'm at least considering this other point, right? What's the odds that in this normal distribution I actually choose this point theta b? It might be a low probability, but there's a probability of it. And then what's the probability? Even if I choose that as my jumping distribution, I then actually have to move there. Right now I'm only considering it. What's the probability that I actually go there? Well, because we know that theta B is better than theta A, we know we go there with 100% chance, right? So that's it. We're done there. Now for the second equation, we have to ask, suppose instead that we started at theta B. And now we want to know what's the odds that in the next iteration, we find ourselves at theta A. All right, well, it's almost the same. So in this case, what are the odds that the previous one was theta B? Well, that's just the probability that we got theta B from the posterior, right? Since we know that we assume that we're already at this supposed equilibrium stationary distribution, all right? If that were the case, that's the probability. And the probability that we end up at A is just theta A given theta B. And then what's the, now that's the probability that we consider it. Now the odds we actually go to it has to be the ratio of the two, right? Because A is actually less than uh, theta B for the, pro, for the posterior. So therefore we have theta A given Y divided by probability of theta B given Y, right? And so now that we have this, we see these two cancel out. And we're left with almost identicals from above. We have P of theta A 
given y times jt of theta a given theta b. So the only difference here is that in this one, we have theta b given theta a. In this one, we have theta a given theta b. Now, that's where it's very important to mention that in the Metropolis algorithm, one of the requirements is that jt of a given b, or a theta a given theta b, has to be equal to jt of theta b given theta a. It has to be a symmetric just jumping distribution. And so what that means is that if you imagine the point here, right? All right, here's our distribution. All this is saying is that if currently we have our point right here, and so now we have the normal distribution around it, and this is our other point, right? The probability of drawing that going from the here to here has to be equal to if we're on here and we then draw the normal distribution around that, the probability of going back to it. And luckily, as long as we keep the same variance on our normal distribution, regardless of where we're centered, that actually holds true. Now, it turns out that the metropolis hasting algorithm allow for these to be different. And all it does is that your odds of accepting something has to be modified a little bit based on the probability, uh, the ratio of how likely you were to have chosen that in the jumping distribution. So it turns out that even if it wasn't true, we could still easily account for it. And that's the metropolis hastings algorithm. But either way, what ends up happening is that in this case, these two are equal. So what does that tell us? Well, it might not seem that useful, but what it tells us is that theta t minus one equals theta a, uh, comma, that the joint distribution here are equal, right? These two are equal. All right. And so what it turns out that this says, right? And this is the part where you're not going to like it. Up to here, you're probably like, I'm okay with this. This makes sense. This part might be the hard part. Whereas the conclusion is that because when you swap them around, you get them that they're equal, it means that, that this joint distribution is symmetric. All right, it's a symmetric distribution, right? So when we swap it around, it's symmetric around here. And whenever you have any sort of distribution, no matter what it's shaped like, you know, it would be like this. But as long as it's symmetric around here, when you go down and you take and this, remember, this is theta t, and this is theta t minus 1. But because we can swap them and we get the same value, when you look at the marginal distribution, right, when we look at the marginal distribution here, they have to be equal. And so what that tells us is that theta t has to be equal to theta t minus 1, right? The probability of theta t has to be equal to the probability of theta t. Uh, t minus 1 has to be equal to the probability of theta t. And that means that if we were drawing, that in the case that we were drawing from the posterior in theta t minus 1, the next draw also has to be from that same distribution, the posterior. So it is a stationary distribution. All right? And that does it. That was the last derivation, all right? But now we see kind of how when we go into the continuous space, it's a little bit difficult to prove some of these things with Markov chains. All right, so now just to finish, you can kind of finally start turning your brains off a little bit, right? We're done with all the derivations. Let's go to the computer real fast and take a look at some of this stuff in action. So right here, we actually have a whole bunch of different algorithms for doing these Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, stuff because it has a bunch of different algorithms here. So first, we're going to look at this random walk Metropolis Hastings. And now let me just give me a minute here. Let me slow this guy down and let me go to a standard normal. And what you're seeing here is, first of all, here's the contour right here of the actual distribution we're trying to draw from. Right here is our jumping distribution, right? So here's our normal distribution. And each time you're seeing an arrow, which is a draw from the jumping distribution 
and it's saying uh, that's the proposal is where the arrow is. And you can see usually when it moves, whenever the, the proposal is further away from the center of this normal distribution, it tends to reject it with that red. And meanwhile, if it's closer, it's go always going to accept it. Now here, it's closer, so it definitely goes. That'll closer, so it goes. That one's further, but wow, it actually wins for it. So even though it was way less likely, it still wins for it because every now and then, there's still that ratio of the two. There's a chance it's going to take it, right? You can see it's going way far away right now, right? So let's speed it up a little bit. And we'll see that right now, it's not a very good distribution, right? But if we speed it up, let it run really fast for a long time, down here, here's the two marginal distributions. You'll start seeing it starts matching the distribution pretty well. Right? It takes it a while, but it gets there. Pretty nifty, huh? All right, here it is right here. Here's this one. And you can change the shape if you want. So instead of doing a standard distribution, let's do a donut. Now, this one's pretty tough. Let me slow this down. Because the problem is that, of course, with the jumping distribution, here's this donut. It pretty much has to stay along this ring. But lots of times, you know, it's going to frequently propose something that's well outside the ring. And it pretty much always has to reject it. You can see it just rejecting them all over the place. So that's a very high rejection rate here. One thing that you can do to get it to uh, be more likely is that right here, here's the proposal sigma. We can turn it up, and now it's has a larger distribution, but now it has even more likely to reject, or you can have it be much smaller. And now at least it's more likely to get something that's actually in the ring. But it also takes a long time to move to the other side of the ring. Here, let's speed it up and watch it go. And that's always the trade-off here between large sigmas and small sigmas. With the small one, it's going to actually accept and move frequently, but it takes a long time to get around the ring. So you can see right now it's way over representing this region of it. And we have to speed it up for a long time for it to actually start moving around the ring. So you can see why in a situation like this, you'll have to run this for hundreds of thousands of iterations. Because look at this, it hasn't even gone to the second half. If we up it a little bit, it'll start moving a little bit faster. Uh, and eventually it will go to the other side. I do promise you that. There it goes, right? Uh, well, there it goes. It made it, right? And then it might hang around here for a while. We'll see. But you can imagine you can run this for a long time. And if you run it for a very long time, you will actually get a good distribution here. But it really does take a long time, all right? And so this is a tough one for the, for the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Uh, you can also do things like the banana. As you can see, this one can cause a problem. So now let's move over. And we aren't going to talk about it at all. But we're going to look at Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is a different one where what you actually do is you simulate uh, this thing as like a ball uh, running along in a hill. And what it's going to do is it actually works the exact same as uh, the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Let me turn off my dark mode so that way you can see easier. But instead of just doing a jumping distribution to propose this next one, it instead has the ball, it simulates the ball moving around along this hill. So let me show you it for the, uh, for the standard normal. So this is like a bowl here. What you can imagine is that the normal distribution is a bowl. And when it runs, it starts it off in a random direction with a different speed. And it kind of just goes along in the bowl back and forth. And then after a certain amount of time, it stops and it says, that's my proposal for where to go. And you can sit there and you can run this really fast. And what it turns out happens is that this samples far more reliably than with the jumping distribution. And you'll see it almost always accepts the proposal. It's about, it's like, it's very, very high. You usually get at least in the 90 percentiles. There's still a chance that you will uh, it doesn't use the same conditions, obviously, as the uh, Metropolis Hastings. Uh, it has more to do with whether or not the ball simulation works all right. Sometimes it has some issues, and then it might reject something because of that. But here it is running. You see it works very well at sampling. And so this is actually the technique that's used in modern Bayesian analysis. 
uh, and pretty much all of it. So here, if you see the donut, watch this go here. Uh, let me slow it down a little bit. You'll see that it actually, because it now follows along where the probability is, it doesn't go off and propose stuff that's way out there. And it actually moves around quite quickly along this. So if you run it here, let me turn it back onto dark mode here just for uh, because it highlights the points. You'll see the points are much better distributed. Right, so we can run this for a bunch of iterations. And you'll see it actually traverses this donut way better than the Metropolis tasting stuff. And so this is actually a pretty, uh, so this is the common techniques that's built into all the modern packages in Beijing analysis. Although there's a few little uh, differences you can do. You can take this and there's something called no U-turn sampling, which is a slight variant on it, which stops us so that way the ball doesn't come back as much. And so when you do this, it um, it works much more reliably. So we can run this with autoplay delay low. It looks like it crashed. I don't know what's going on here. Let me try refreshing it and see what happens. Uh, efficient. There it goes. I think it had some issues at the beginning. But this is this is pretty much the most modern algorithm where it does something very similar, but it watches out. You can see how it turns red whenever it's going, starting on a U-turn, and it actually uses that to figure out to do better proposals than actually the standard Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And so this is a pretty cool thing. I just wanted to show you how this works. You can see it samples from this 2D distribution very nicely. And I think that does it. I think we've actually hit everything. I don't know yet what we'll do in class. I'll figure it out before the class. Uh, we can probably do some examples on how you can actually do some Bayesian inference using uh, Hamiltonian, Monte Carlo, and, and MCMC. But then pretty much what we're going to do is we're going to move on from here after this and start looking at what do we do about these dynamic programming environments where we actually don't know what the state is. And so we have these uncertain parameters and we have to use the data we see to figure out what state we're in. And that state that we think we're in dictates what our decision's going to be. So we have to optimize about gathering information and then making decisions based off the information that we gather. And so that's gonna be really cool. All right, I'll see you in class.